nobody can have missed the huge way that the coronavirus has impacted the world. And that includes the world of Pentecostals and Charismatics that uh, consist of uh, more or less half a billion people around the world. Now, the World Pentecostal Fellowship did an initiative earlier this year in order to inform people, primarily in the majority world, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, about the impact of the coronavirus and what to do. And Niklas Lindgren, who is with us today, knows more about that. So I would like you, Niklas, to explain what was this initiative and what need in the churches and in these local communities did this initiative fill? Mm, thank you. Uh, to understand the, why we did it, I think uh, just a brief background. Um, we were some development organizations within the Pentecostal movement globally from Finland, from Sweden, from Canada, uh, from Norway that met for some years discussing the fact that the development money is not enough to do what we need to do. We need to uh, understand more how the church can be involved in responding to the needs in, in the society uh, in different ways without development funding, maybe. Uh, so we met in Calgary during the World Pentecostal Conference to discuss if we could do more together. And then as, <laughs> as we approach springtime, this COVID-19 or, or, or coronavirus hit the world and we decided to try to do something together. So we invited, uh, I mean, we would develop the material. You can find it on, on uh, uh, pwfmissions.net. Uh, we developed the materials on uh, what is COVID-19, uh, protective measures, why should churches respond and how could churches respond? And then uh, uh, we uh, worked on a global webinar with people from DRC, Brazil, India, Sweden, US, uh, Kenya, Philippines, to bring different voices from uh, different perspectives on how the church could respond and why the church should respond. So we had people from, I, I don't remember, like 70 countries uh, attending the webinar. Uh, and then, I mean, the background is that we, we wanted to, for the people to understand in our movement globally that we are the largest and fastest growing social movement probably there is. And if we are quiet in such a situation, it will affect the world heavily. We, we have to do something. So we were looking into different research and we were looking how to combine development theory and good theology and bring, bring people uh, together to do something. So uh, the result was actually, uh, we just got a report from what happened from, from January to June, when it comes to uh, actions to, to fight the spread of the virus. And um, we have now a report saying that in 92 countries, we did things together as a network uh, with a budget exceeding 72, 71 million US dollar. Uh, with nine different organizations contributing with this statistics. And it's about food security, economic relief, refugee camps, I mean, support to refugee camps, assistance to pastors, uh, medical supplies, and so on. So it was organizations doing this together, but they are all connected to Pentecostal movements around the world. And we wanted to, to do something. And, and you asked what, what, what need did it meet? And uh, one story just to tell the importance of, I think, what we did. Um, a pastor uh, friend from, from Kenya who said like this, uh, from our partner network in Kenya, he said, before you said something, the only voice we heard was from the UN and from the authorities. And the mistrust in our country among church people towards the UN and towards the, the local government, the mistrust is there so people wouldn't act. But when we had a voice from the <laughs> from the global Pentecostal network, suddenly the pastors would listen and they would act and, and try to do something. So we tried. <laughs> yeah, it, this is really fascinating. And, and especially what you mentioned there on the end, that the fact that it was a Pentecostal initiative to highlight this, to highlight things like, yes, God can heal, but also do things, wash 
your hand, just keep social distance, that there's mm -hmm. no conflict there. And uh, that really w was impactful. And uh, I know more of us here have experiences and, and have researched uh, how Pentecostals um, have reacted to a thing like uh, the pandemic. So I'm curious uh, from, for example, uh, Jörg Haustein, um, when you have been looking at um, Pentecostalism more globally, what could there be as factors for this skepticism that Nicholas uh, describes uh, to, to authorities and how does that um, impact uh, the, the action that needs to be mm. taken? Mm. Well, I, I, I want to take your question a little bit sideways because I'm not sure we're really within our rights to speak of one Pentecostal movement. You know, we always do that. We talk about the 500 million, but, you know, PMU network, for example, is, is a relatively confined space of who you work with, uh, where you come from, and the same you could do with other Pentecostal networks. So what does the RCCG have to do with PMU, for example, right? Or... Uh, universal church of kingdom of god so the same thing really then goes for what pentecostals are doing within the pandemic um you have examples from either side so what i hear from ethiopia for example is the mainline pentecostals were not at all um disobedient to the government um so they did shut down i don't know about the the um Haywood Barhan Church, which is the Swedish uh, descendant. Kenya, the situation is different. The political situation is different. So we have the political factors. We have a lot of, it, we have a very diverse movement. And actually one of the things I'm working on these days is to try and figure out what Pentecostalism might look like 10 years from now. This kind of fragmentation goes on and we're actually beginning to lose these large global bodies that can speak for the whole movement as mega churches that are themselves global take that place. So within, we're living within this very divergent place where the reactions can be so different depending on what denomination you're talking about. So I'm, I'll admit I do the typical academic thing here. <laughs> I kind of deconstruct the question, but that's the only way I know how to answer it because, um, yeah, the examples abound from different areas of people driving out the demon of COVID and others basically just mirroring government advice. One thing I find very interesting is the question of Pentecostalism development. And this is one area where I've also done a little bit of work. And again, here, uh, there's a number of factors at play. Firstly, how the government engages with global development actors and how they bring in faith-based organizations on the ground. But the other thing, uh, and I think this is where the PMU initiative is very important, is also the other side of that two-way street. So how much can Pentecostals feed in of their own desires to make sense of this pandemic, to perhaps even meet in certain circumstances and ways, um, or um, pray about the pandemic, even though the meeting might be funded by a secular organization. So it's, it's how, how far is the development side willing to give to incorporate Pentecostal actors and their uh, um, idiosyncrasies, as it were, from the, from the development side and understanding pandemic and explaining the world. That's another question that emerges here for me. So to put it succinctly, I think we, we first of all, we really need to study very specifically what goes on and then how bilateral these pathways really are and working together with Pentecostals in um, battling the COVID pandemic. Yeah, and that's a very good point. Pentecostalism is a very diverse uh, movement that looks very differently, not only in different countries, but as you say, also different movements within the same country. Yeah, and they don't even recognize one another. You know, that's the other thing. The churches won't co collaborate necessarily. And they actually, they fill this kind of space between I don't know, let's put it to the US, Trump supporters, non-mask wearers and social justice Pentecostals, they have less to do with one another than a Pentecostal may have with a mainline Lutheran. So we have to be careful how we frame the discussion. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts from the other panelists on when in specific situations where there might be uh, skepticism or hostility among Pentecostals globally uh, towards taking action uh, on a pandemic, uh, what could be possible causes of that? I think, I think in the U.S. context, um, we're dealing with a profound degree of political polarization. And that political polarization actually precludes something that Jorg is suggesting, which is, for instance, what he's described as bilateral pathways, ways for 
people to be engaged um, in sort of a robust way of response, right? There are many Pentecostals who are, you know, avid um, users of the medical system who have their doctors who have been treated for one thing or another. Um, but in today's polarized culture, they're sort of leaning into um, a certain degree of suspicion of the federal government, a degree of suspicion of even medical authorities, which is historical. And the polarization is preventing a very sensible ask for what you've just described, Yorg, as a bilateral response, which is um, actually sounds very in keeping with what American Pentecostals look to as a sort of religious freedom. Like, is there a way to facilitate prayer um, under certain conditions? Because prayer would be one response that American Pentecostals would want to be able to take, um, undertake, but instead um, they're seeing a sort of um, scientific orthodoxy, the idea that, you know, there's a scientific response and then all other responses are either not as important or um, competing responses, right? So people are not suggesting within political discourse that they can be um, harmonized or integrated. So, and I think that's partly the polarization of our culture, right? We talk a lot about polarization in the media, polarization in the political sphere, but it's also just also the way that people know how to respond and know how to in integrate. Um, what to, to our minds looks like competing responses. And I'm so interested about um, skepticism toward Brussels, if I heard you correctly, because um, we flatly see a lot of skepticism and have seen within Pentecostal quarters, a lot of skepticism um, towards the federal government in a perennial sense. Um, the report that I did, the reporting I did from the Washington Post was um, taking us all the way back to early Pentecostalism in the US. Um, so that 1915, 1920s period where we were feeling really dubious about the role of professionals, the role of authorities, including scientific and medical authority. So I feel that it's really generous to look at these things side by side with Brussels because there's an easy way for this to look like just an American story and just an American problem. And Eric, I, I think you provided the perfect segue for us to talk about history and Pentecostal history regarding pandemics, you mentioned the period 1915 to 1920, where another pandemic arose, the so-called Spanish flu, which did not originate in Spain, but Spain was one of the European countries uh, less um, uh, ordered to, to just focus on the war that was going on. And so more reports came from Spain about this uh, virus than from other countries. And Daniel, you have been looking at how Pentecostals reacted to the Spanish flu back in the day in 1918 to 1920. And would it be fair to say that you were surprised when you found out how they reacted? Yeah, so um, I first got exposed to the Spanish flu uh, pandemic uh, through Kim Alexander's work, uh, Pentecostal Healing. She did a whole case study on how Pentecostal viewed healing uh, through that case study, and, and she found some, you know, sort of divergent opinions there. And so, anyway, when this whole thing hit, I, I just thought, you know what, I, I should go back and look and see how uh, Pentecostals responded to, to that. So, being from the Symbols of God, I, I, I went into our uh, paper, the Pentecostal Evangel, and the first one I found was Springfield closed down in 1918, in, in October, when uh, the, the, the flu, the influenza took over that, that whole city. And so there's this big, you know, sort of announcement, you know, Springfield is closed and all the churches have closed down. And what I, what I found really interesting because I, because I was hearing the conversation with, you know, should we close down? Should we obey, you know, uh, the world health organization? Should we, you know, should we listen to the health department? Those sorts of conversations were already taking place. And right there in the announcement was uh, the health department has ordered churches closed down, so we're closed. And it was just such a stark contrast to what I was hearing, at, you know, within uh, within the culture at the time. And so, you know, just looking through it, there was really a couple really interesting responses. Uh, you had um, you had leaders like uh, J. H. King and um, uh, Taylor. Uh, from the Pentecostal holiness side, they were saying, you know, hey, we're shut down. Uh, we, we just have to turn ourselves to prayer. and We have to turn ourselves to caring for one another. 
Uh, and then over on the Sims of God, you had a very similar thing. You know, we were having revivals and uh, uh, we, we've been shut down, but we're, but we're going out and visiting the sick. And one particular instance that happened here in Tulsa was Amy Simple McPherson was supposed to come uh, to do a revival. And uh, so uh, S.A. Jameson was the pastor here in Tulsa. And, and he said, hey, don't come, you know, don't come. The pandemic is here. And, and, uh, but Amy just felt in her spirit, you know, like I, I need to go, I need to go. And so she ended up coming on the day that Tulsa lifted their ban on public gatherings. And she went through the streets and she ministered to a lot of people who uh, were suffering from the flu. She said that the requests were endless. And so anyway, you know, so you have these sort of different, different things taking place that I thought were really interesting. One is just the ability to listen to the mandates of the city. You know, you didn't see a lot of pushback. You didn't say, you know, oh, they're, you know, they're, the devil's trying to get us sort of things. You know, there was a, there was a real sort of acceptance of that. And then there was the, just the acknowledgement that everybody was suffering and we need to minister to those, those, those who are suffering. So <clears throat> there was a real um, element there of, of reaching out. And, you know, I think that compassion driven sort of response and the compliance driven response, you know, those two things were working together really well. And, and I, it just, for me, it gave a lot of comfort. And then when I shared it through the blog that I wrote, um, it was almost like pastors were saying, oh my goodness, thank you. Like, thank you for making it okay for me to be compassionate and to be compliant, right? There was this, this sense of relief from pastors that they felt like that was the right thing to do, but the history sort of gave them the, the footing to be able to try to do that. That's very interesting. And I see a parallel here with pastors today getting this confirmation this acceptance from the pastors of the past similar to what nicholas described that leaders in developing countries get sort of confirmation and um they they are encouraged by seeing that the pentecostal world fellowship uh stands behind um taking action and as you uh, put it daniel uh, to be compassionate and compliant to the recommendations um, any other thoughts from our other panelists on the uh, perhaps differences or possibly similarities when we listen to the history compared to Pentecostalism today? I have a couple of points I'd share on that. One, I generally do more on oneness Pentecostals, so I did get asked by a reporter about oneness Pentecostals specifically. And you really can't parse them off in 1914 because the split is sort of taking place then, but it's not yet codified. So that gets hard to study, right? When it's, so it's a harder sell to sell the history to oneness Pentecostals in some way. The other thing I would like to think about, and there's actually been some disability studies people who've made me think about this. For most people living in 2020, they've never seen their bodies fail them or fell them to a degree that medical science couldn't fix. And so when they're presented with this pandemic, in a way that really hasn't happened in their lifetime, they expect everything will be okay. Well, in 1918, they didn't have that. Um, in 1918, medicine was much more limited. This was pre-antibiotic, it was pre-all kinds of things. And so, I'm wondering how much, even though we sometimes see Pentecostals resents the science of COVID, that there's this underlying belief that the doctors can fix this. The doctors have fixed everything else. And that this technology is, might be driving some of the resistance that we're seeing now. I'd like to sort of ping back on that, Andrea. Um, in two ways. One is looking at the way that early Pentecostals in the US, and I don't know to what degree, Jorg, you can kind of triangulate against this, but 
the way that early Pentecostals in the U.S. were there, were on the scene to challenge the rise of the development of medicine into a professional field. So as Andrea is saying, like, this is still kind of a early period in the development of medicine as we now know it. So you have some really famous and, and not only famous early Pentecostals sort of challenging this rise. Charles Parham, everybody's favorite early American Pentecostal preacher. That's a joke, but yeah, um, is there to say like, don't let, uh, don't let these guys like dope and dissect you. Don't let med like medical practitioners um, lay you on their altars, right? Like that language of the sim like that symmetry of power, like don't let them do that to you um, because you're a believer, uh, which is really interesting because I think that's what the background is when we say like Pentecostal p pastors might be helped to see that it's okay to be compliant it's okay to be compassionate. Well, why is that the case? Why is it that we need a sort of group, a group pushed in this direction? Well, in one case, in the American case, I would say there's a sort of like old, I'm thinking now like an old nemesis, right? Like um, the medical profession just wasn't embraced uh, wholeheartedly. And there's like a sort of way that the culture of Pentecostalism carries that forward, like the subculture. And then I'd like to put up put out um, that actually this is a populist, this is a populist period in the U.S. So Daniel, I'm, I don't know how to read what you've said about our response, like U.S. Pentecostal response to the Spanish flu, but I do know that right now um, American Pentecostals have lined up behind a populist candidate and then a populist president um, to I mean, to their shame in the media, by the way, but they have done that, I think mostly because they are themselves part of a popular subculture, which is populism. Um, I'll do a short definition. It's just like this, uh, this culture, this belief that the people, as opposed to uh, a king or a, now a president or Washington, for instance, now we could think of these things as analogous, that they are like the holders of democratic virtue and that they should be principal actors on the democratic stage, like the people. So it's a very um, like down home political theology. And we've seen the, the proof of that in the popularity of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump recently. Populism is on the rise. So I would look at differences in response right now um, as always potential germs within, germs in the scientific sense, which haha, but germs within American Pentecostalism, it is always potential for them to get kind of populist in their orientation and we have we've seen a uh, populist rhetoric in terms of like the swamp and for instance what i'll say back to my article in the washington post tyranny like the way that the mask represents tyranny it represents political overreach in our churches so um i guess i'll i'll sort of leave that there for anybody who wants to pick it up but i i'm interested in thinking about how we can maybe look at our populist sensibilities in the U.S. and shift them elsewhere, like maybe not about the mass, maybe let's choose a different way of um, signaling our like unwillingness to be dominated by science or by the federal government. Yeah, I, I, I mean, two things I would say to that. So one side, if you're doing the history of Pentecostalism in, in Africa, for example, then one major thing that arises here is that actually in 1918, Nigerian Christians begin to part from mainland denominations, precisely in the COVID and uh, no, Spanish flu pandemic, and saying, well, you're shutting down churches, you have all these Bible stories you've been teaching us about healing, and you can't even trust your own faith. So they're rebelling during this time. And this I mean, there's lots of other things going on about baptism, but healing is a huge healing and the use of medicine is a huge part of this. And this leads to the formation of the so-called Aladura prayer movement, which is originally an African independent movement. And on top of that, um, large parts of Pentecostalism are saddled then. That's not the only story about Nigerian Pentecostalism, but that's the main branch that we have today that develops out of that. So a very different story. And I'm wondering with regard to the US, I see, I see the same tension in the early Pentecostalism. You think about Dewey making fun of, you know, if you put him in the pre-story, making fun of established medicine. And then in 1918, you have the Assemblies of God saying, let's shut down. So I'm wondering, and I wonder if you can speak to this, Daniel, how much of this is actually representative or do we have sort of a denomination that hones in on a desire to finally be respectable because that will be the trajectory over the next 30 years, joining 
you know, uh, uh, evangelicalism becoming sort of the respectable denomination. And then finally, a question that I would have and that, um, that keeps running through my head is where then does this new populism come from? And I do wonder if a lot of the sort of culture of spiritual warfare uh, this idea that we live in alternative reality that you constantly have to diagnose, which was very popular in the 90s, has not fueled uh, part of this anti-government establishment um, with this constant sense of persecution. I mean, I have a lot of close experience with Pentecostals in Massachusetts who often feel just drowned out by all these liberals and then retreat. And this fuels their skepticism. And it's often read through a spiritual lens that these people are out to get my faith. They're here to kill the babies. And so, so all of these things get read spiritually and fuel into, like you said, Erica, into this whole rejection of science, whether it's coming from the government or not, because even mainstream medicine is then abandoned and people resort to YouTube uh, advice about bleach and whatnot um, um, to, for, for their health. Yeah, I'll just, say, brief. Yeah, yeah, go on. I'll just say something just quickly that, you know, um, I wrote a, a chapter for a book on uh, different Christian views of the origin of disease. So I did a Pentecostal perspective on that. <clears throat> and one thing that's really interesting is um, you do have this, you, you, have, you have these two things held sort of in concert. You have what Erica is pointing out, sort of this view of, of doctors and skeptic, skepticism, but it's a very pragmatic skepticism in some ways. It's like we, we, we watch how medicine doesn't work the altar works, right? And so you, you, you have the, it is, a, it is sort of a pragmatism when it comes to the rejection of medicine. It's not just, you know, ideological in, in some ways. Um, but in 1911, the Pentecostal Holiness Church actually issued an edict that said, we are not against medicine. And, and, and so, you know, you, you do have these, some of these, some of these things already taking place um, in that time. And so when, it, when I look at something like, uh, you know, the response that I saw there, um, it was never, it was never in a sense of we reject government. So they, they may not have accepted medicine uh, for a pragmatic reason, right? Because healing was a better way, right? There's a, there's a better way, there's a faster way, right? Um, so, um, but so you just had this sort of general acceptance of maybe in a way that we don't, we don't today, there wasn't a lot of rights talk, like we have a right to be open. You know, we, we have a, we have a responsibility to be open. There was just sort of a, they accepted the fact that they're in this with the rest of culture. Now that said, the Spanish flu incident with Pentecostalism only, it, it was a, a couple months at a time. And it's not at all like we're experiencing now, which is months and months and months on end, right? So there was, there was these little pockets of, and, and, and they'd be over fairly quickly. So had, had that sustained longer, perhaps some of those more, you know, uh, anti uh, sentiments of authority and, and things like that uh, would have shown up. Niklas. Well, I wouldn't have much to say about the American perspectives on this. So just adding another thing, we have ended up in, in very interesting dialogues with our church networks, mainly in Africa, where, I mean, when they have realized that, okay, we are now making up like 10, 15, 20% of the population, our Pentecostal denomination, and then there are so many other churches. So then they, they start to ask themselves questions. How can we be quiet when things happen? How can we not speak out? How can we continue to expect others to work for a better society. We are the ones to have to fight corruption and so on and so on. <laughs> so I think also with, with the growth, we need to realize that the role that the church has to play, it has to be different from when we were a minority church. In many countries where we work, it is a my majority church now. Uh, so um, just a comment on, 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 on the, the way we view ourselves as a network, what responsibility comes with that growth uh, and and uh, how do we deal with that uh, that shift in identity that's very so that's, interesting mm -hmm. yeah and uh, now the uh, politicization of taking action against the coronavirus that we've been talking about uh, seems to be a, a very relevant thing in a u.s context it's very clearly politicized there 
uh, compared to other countries. And so since we have an international panel here today, um, even though we're only two continents represented, but at least that's more than one <laughs> and, and it's more than one country. I think, I think that's quite apparent because uh, in, in many European countries, it might not be as politicized and polarized uh, compared to the American context. And uh, I'm wondering, Andrea, uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how this politic politicization uh, arose and, and how it impacts everything? I think it's a perfect storm of events. And I want to say with what I'm talking about, these tendencies are stronger among white American Pentecostals than among others. It doesn't mean they don't exist in other groups, they're just stronger in white groups. Um, a couple of things that factor in here, you have this shift in Pentecostals being allied with the political right, in particular with the Republican Party, started with sort of their involvement in the 40s and the National Association of Evangelicals, sort of codified by Reagan in the 1980s. And since then, they've kind of been loyal to the Republican Party more than they have to sort of a conservative platform or conservative morality all the time. I uh, combine that with a mistrust in science. We've kind of talked about that, but going back and sort of to the early days of Pentecost, the mistrust of theories related to evolution, these debates, scientists then became sort of sermon punching bags. And so that has kind of transferred over to other aspects of science as well. On top of that, there's an emphasis in faith healing in the Pentecostal movement, right? Just ask God and he'll take it away. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Well, I knew it was bad, but I just prayed and um, went to service anyway, kind of thing. Um, also, I think we need to think about control of the body. Pentecostals have since the beginning of the movement used the body, in particular women's bodies, but used the body to send messages about the movement. Whether it's, look, our women are holy, look how they dress, we're not crazy like you've been telling everybody. Or whether it's, look, um, Amy Simple McPherson was great about this, look at the affluence of our movement, we can afford all these things. Pentecostals use the body very often to send messages. And they're very particular then about what's allowed with the body. And this plays into abortion, birth control, uh, gay marriage, sex ed, <laughs> even back to the earlier days of conscientious objector, what bodies have to go to war. And so the only time that Pentecostals want the state involved in issues of the body is when the state is doing exactly what Pentecostals want with the body. And sort of the restrictions on services, whether it's wearing masks or whether it's where and when you can meet or how many people you can have in a building, are sort of this perfect storm of things. When you don't trust science enough to believe that there's a real pandemic, when you believe that faith is just gonna rescue you anyway, and when you already don't like what the state is allowing with bodies and you're worried about the state not doing with bodies what you want them to, then it's a perfect storm for politicians to come in and then sort of co-op those fears and co-op those claims and sort of magnify them. And so in the American context, we have politicians who are very good at figuring out what Pentecostals as a whole are kind of worried about and then playing to that. And this, these restrictions on services, the demand for masks, they play into fears and concepts with things with the body. Very interesting. <clears throat> I'd like to back that up. Yeah, I'd yeah. like to back that up because um, what uh, Dr. Johnson has just suggested is exactly the relationship I think that Pentecostals have historically wanted between um, religion and the state, right? Which is, she's just said, you know, they're interested in the state getting involved when the state is doing their bidding, right? When the state is, for instance, prohibiting abortion. Um, that is an interesting use of the state. When the state is trying to allow it, Pentecostals are not interested, right? Or like conservative religionists, I'll say that. They're less interested in that kind of state deployment of authority, right? And I would like to suggest that this is about alignment of a certain kind of rhetoric 
with the state apparatus. So think about, for instance, times that we've gone to war. Historically, that's generally been um, a, a time of crisis in the life of the country in which you'll see religious rhetoric employed. So you'll see like axis of evil, light and dark, those kinds of um, that sort of moral symbolic repertoire will get religious. You almost never hear like we should go to war because I mean, there's like science reasons that we should do it, right? And so like, that's what I'd call like religion as an authorizing discourse, right? What, what Pentecostals, what, is it chaps their hide? Is that a good text? Is it what chaps their hide? Is when um, science moves into that position of an authoritative discourse, which they saw happen at like this with other evangelicals at the Scopes trial, when we're starting to teach, for instance, evolution in schools, right? The displacement of religious discourse by science discourse is something that they generally have an allergy to. So everything that Dr. Johnson just said, I would underscore. I'd also like to underscore this. I think that the, the body as a religious, um, as, a re as a mode of religion, like a way of producing religious goods is one good way of thinking about Pentecostalism. Like uh, practices like tarrying in the spirit until you might have like a word, you might have a, 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 an experience of knowledge, you might experience the Holy Spirit, you might have a vision, you might have a dream. Those kinds of things, like those things happening um, are not, for instance, something that you got out of studying Jeremiah. Does that make sense? But instead through um, using your body as a means of religious experience. So there's this way that it would be hard to do both, right? It would be hard to believe that your body is the primary site and node of religious experience and also should be um, an object for medical intervention or like a site of medical authority. It's just really hard to do those two things at the same time. Although to your point, um, all of you, I think I've made this point at some point in it, it can be done, right? People know how to braid um, registers of, you know, now my body's going to the doctor, now my body's at the altar. Like it, it can, they can do both, but there's, it's not hard to see that there's times when those two things, especially with the life of the nation clash and Pentecostals have been uh, historically those who will double down on that body as a religious body. And I'd like to just point out something else and I'll be done. You mentioned your mega churches. Andrea, you mentioned like, Pastor Tony Snell and I in Louisiana. And I wanna think about with you guys, the way that um, this has been covered in the media because actually I just was in San Antonio where John Hagee's very large 15,000 to 17,000 member church. That's only um, a mile away from my parents' house and I have it on good authority, like slash my parents, that there, there's not a lot of really fastidiousness around mask wearing. Right. So I want to put that on there because it's very easy to kind of ostracize like a Pastor Tony Snell in Louisiana who like might have, I don't know, Andrea, maybe 200 people. I don't know how big that church is. Um, <laughs> the numbers vary. <laughs> he will claim up into the thousands range. Okay. Then I'm wrong. Evangelistically speaking or not. Okay. So I just want to think together around like the way that the, the not... Um, institutional Pentecostalism can actually be part more of this story than another story. Thank you. More thoughts on this before we move on. Jörg? Um, just to, just to um, come back with a question really. So, and I'll admit that perhaps my American echo chamber doesn't go deep enough for this, but some of my resources are drawn more from like people who no longer go to Pentecostal churches or who, who are sort of affiliated, but so definitely smaller, not the mega church context. But I get the sense that supernatural healing isn't that much part of the conversation in the States. It is much more about government authority, what type of medicine to trust, what not to trust, alternative medicine. So you're almost seeing sort of a merging of, of, of an almost esoteric view of the world in terms of medical alternatives, et cetera, and Pentecostalism. Whereas what I hear from Africa, there are still a lot more of the supernatural promises. COVID won't touch you. COVID has healed you. Um, we pray again and then you go test again, like it's often done with HIV epidemics, uh, HIV uh, diagnoses. So uh, my question is, is it correct to say that in America, this is much less of a spiritual battle as it were, in terms of healing and much more of a political battle because 
in Africa, I'm not so sure. It, the state is relatively weak anyhow. So the battle with COVID is more on the existential front. What is in it? What's happening to me this year? What's, you know, is, is God going to heal me? Is it going to come to me and my family? How can I get protection from it? Also because I don't have a medical system to fall back on. Whereas in America, we have a much longer history where healing has been kind of relegated to the corner of the unequal length leg and, you know, back pain and, and colds. And, and the, the, yes, occasionally also cancer, but all those places where the medical system may not have enough resources available. I would say your take is accurate to what I've observed. Most of the time that I've seen faith healing talked about, it's been in the context of, okay, I'm going to take this risk. I'm going to go to church, even though maybe I shouldn't. I'm going to not wear this mask, even though maybe I should. Uh, because I believe that even if I do get it, God will take care of it. So it allows them, this faith healing allows them to participate in this sort of resistance to the science or resistance to the government, however they're perceiving it. But yes, it's less about faith healing as a thing itself. It's more about faith healing as a thing that allows them to uh, participate in these other acts of resistance. Uh, uh, let me just throw in another thing. I'm but glad you brought that up, George, because I was really fascinated by uh, this African doctor who came out a few months ago about the use of hydrochloroquine. You remember that? And the way she framed it, it was really, it was just a strange sort of mixing of a medicine, right? Like I'm a Pentecostal. I believe in healing. I believe it's, you know, demonic in origin. And yet, you need this medicine in order to recover. It was just, it was a strange sort of um, thing to get my head around, you know, that sort of African view that, you know, just keep praying. And yet she's sort of the leading voice trying to argue that all we need is this medicine. It was, just, it was an interesting study for me to try to figure out how, how that how that was working in the mind of people like, oh, it's just, just take a medicine. You're, you'll be fine. Just take a med You know, people who believed in healing were just saying that. And yet at the same time, rejecting, you know, science and other things at the same time. It was just, just to clarify for the audience, this doctor is uh, Stella Emanuel, who uh, was born in Cameroon and uh, got her medical training in Nigeria and now lives in the U.S. And she got headlines when uh, her video was promoted by both the president and his son, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, Erica, you wanted to comment too. Yeah, I've seen a lot of um, conspiracy theory, which we're also struggling with um, to correctly understand and address in the US. Conspiracy theory around hydrochloroquine. Am I saying that right? Um, so I hear it almost all the time, the sort of that that should have been allowed and something about Governor Cuomo inhibiting people from taking it and that is just crazy. So there is a way that strangely there's a scientific, um, like the scientific discourse is there, right? This medicine would work, but then it's overwhelmed by the negative political polarization, right? But there's like a, and then the, I should also mention there's the belief some in some circles that this is a specifically Chinese disease. So the, the disease has from its beginnings a sort of political life, right? That there's a, that there, it's possible to make this conspiracy theory. But I'd also like to point out that I think in the US we're at a point where medical authority is a little bit weak. Um, as visible in the way that we've been having a problem with what people call an anti-vax movement, but could also be thought of just like vaccine lazy or vaccine hesitant. And a lot of people, for good reason, have been looking at evangelicals like, we're pretty sure it's you guys, you guys aren't vaccinating. But it's not just evangelicals, it's also uh, women who have master's degree or higher and can make up to, or with $100,000 or more, are uh, very likely to be vaccine um, lax, right? Masking lax. And I'd just like to point that out as a way that uh, the cultural terrain is more complicated um, that's feeding into this Pentecostal movement. I, I think at the time that med the rise of medical science was becoming um, clear in the U.S. culture, it displaced something called Thompsonian botanical science, which is like really popular, like you could take herbs and flowers and mix them and be healthy. And now we see the rise of something similar like that in um, the figure of Gwyneth Paltrow and her goop medicine out on the West Coast. So I think 
you know, and people are like, oh no, it's really, I mean, people are clutching their pearls. Like the orthodoxy of medicine is coming under fire, but it's not always from predictable sources. Thank you. Uh, this is a fascinating discussion, and I think that we could go on for long, but we're going to uh, start to wrap up. And I would like us to take us back to the international perspective. We started with the uh, Global Init Initiative of the World Pentecostal Fellowship in order to help people uh, cope with the pandemic. And so, Nicholas, I would like uh, you to uh, talk a little bit about the future what does the situation look like globally in developing countries regarding the pandemic? And what should be we watchful about? We've been talking a lot about the US, which is natural. There are a lot of Americans present in, in this panel. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, when it comes to countries that are way much poorer than the US or than uh, European nations, uh, what will the pandemic do there? And what can we do to help? Yeah, thank you for an interesting dialogue. I, I, I didn't have much to contribute on the US uh, perspective on this, but the thing is, uh, as I listen to you, it is so important that we get things right here and that we get the church do the right thing because the pandemic is hitting, I mean, everything is affected in the, in the countries where we work. It's affected, uh, I mean, they say now that we all already lost five years of development. Uh, due to the crisis. Uh, it's the first year since, you know, Human Development Index, the way the UN would measure development. It's the first year since 1990 where we see a decrease. I mean, it's, it's affecting a lot. Uh, human rights are de affected, democracy. I mean, in, in Africa, less than 18% of the population in Africa rely on, on any kind of social security system. So that means that they will every day have to go out and, and I mean, do something to earn money for, for getting food. Uh, and, and as the countries have closed down, you, you could realize what happens. <laughs> there are no security systems whatsoever. So um, we see that uh, when, when schools have shut down, a lot of girls are now left out of school. They will not go back to school because the families cannot afford so the school, the, there will be a lost generation, some say, of, of girls that never get education and they end up in, in child marriages. We see that violence is increasing a lot, domestic violence against both women and children. Uh, we see that repressive governments now take action because they want to make use of this situation to uh, put laws in place that will limit uh, the, the opportunities for media to be free. They will limit the op opposition. They will make it very hard for human rights activists. In our network, we have Dr. McQuig, who was the Nobel Peace Prize winner uh, two years ago. Uh, he has been on a death threat for, for uh, some time now. Uh, so it happens everywhere that activists that fight for the right thing and fight for the truth uh, they are very, very exposed now in this crisis. And, and when it comes to the humanitarian needs in the world, they say now that only 28% of the needs are covered financially right now. And in, in, during this, I mean, the rest of the year, we will see an increase in, in the number of people that will need humanitarian aid from 179 million to 400 million. And they say that 78% of them will not be able to get any support because lack of funds. So I'm just, when I listen to you, <laughs> I'm just feeling that it is, it is crucial that we help the church to be salt and light and telling the truth and, and be there in the community. Because if the church is quiet, if the church leaders are quiet, who will be there for the, for the people? Who will be there for the su suffering population? So. It's, it's, it's a matter of life and death, uh, really, what the church will do and how the church will respond. That's my, there are so many things to say about how this is affecting societies, but we hear, we hear reports every day from, from around the world how this is hitting the economy, democracy, respect for human rights, health systems, priorities, schooling, everything. So... Um, it is really, really important that we, that we get the church to, to, to 
tell the truth about the crisis and how to protect ourselves, but also to do things for the people that are vulnerable and then, um, well, lose everything now. Thank you for sharing. Mm. Some thoughts from the other panelists on what the church can do to help Jörg? Yeah, so um, I, I think that's that's very, very important what you just said. Um, and two, I would just, two additional observations perhaps. So on the one hand, uh, in addition to sort of just religious networks, we need global governance networks to engage with religious actors more. And this is one of the things that has come out of my research on religions and sustainable development goals is that as much as the UN tried to involve civil society actors in setting the goals, they're letting them be completely bypassed by state actors in measuring and implementing the goals. So all of that sort of activation that could have been done has been missed and is yet once again left to sort of religious networks. So I think that's, that's, it's one very important aspect that's, that's often neglected that a lot of even the official money doesn't really adopt grassroots um, approaches. And the other thing I would say is, again, sorry to bring it back to America, but the political erosion really does have a huge effect on Africa, for example, because the US is setting a standard for contest, not setting a standard, it's copying, you could almost argue, African models of contested democracy at the moment. And that enables strong men all, all over the place. Mm -hmm. And a country that's very dear to my heart, Ethiopia, of course, we have a Pentecostal leader who also won the Nobel Peace Prize, doing some very controversial things. And an opposition and a church that's rather quiet. Um, the situation is very complicated. It's very difficult to judge from the outset. But we're looking essentially at a country where ethnic tensions are so high that the future is all but certain. And here again, the church would need to step in with models of peace building, of bringing societies together. And what we're seeing instead is a failure of global Pentecostalism to do just that, to build civil society. And it starts, or perhaps not starts, but the decline of the US that we're seeing is not really helping this uh, global conversation either because then what comes over to Africa is just a continuation of those same culture wars. Maybe just a, a short comment. Uh, there is a lot of good dialogue going on on how to link uh, the governments and, and those streams of money to religious actors in a, in a better way. So I think that's hopeful for the future. A lot is being done, but uh, also a lot of learning is taking place, how to work together with religious leaders, for example. And a lot of learnings took place, for example, in, in West Africa during the Ebola crisis, the importance of working together with the religious leaders in order to, to, to reach what, where we, where we want to go. Um, so um, let, let's hope for more of cooperation. But we as church networks, we have to be active and, and seek for cooperation also uh, and, and be open to other networks to work together. And of course, PMU is, is, is a quite unique, uh, in a unique place because the government has used you, the Swedish government has used you in the past in so many ways. And, and in that sense, that doesn't happen in many countries with Pentecostals. Yeah. I think, I think that was really wonderful about, about the World Pentecostal Fellowship's response even you know the the pamphlet that you all created was you got the sense that the church felt a responsibility to educate and you know uh on behalf of the community the global community or the, the world and i think that's something that the american pentecostal church needs to learn from is to see themselves as partners in that education process and not just you know, sort of self-preservation in a sense, you know, what's good for us. Um, but to see ourselves, you know, in, in, in you know, in, in many countries, uh, you know, if the Pentecostal pastors don't receive good information and, and if the groups don't disseminate the, the good information, you know, people's lives are at stake, like, like you said. And I think, I think that's something we all need to learn from. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for this, fascinating and uh, rich discussion that we've had. We have been covering a lot, the whole world, in fact, <laughs> uh, looking at how uh, Pentecostalism has dealt with the coronavirus, uh, both today and in history. And I have learned a lot. 
Uh, and I really hope that the audience that will look, look at this will also learn uh, a lot. So thank you all for your time and for your very interesting contributions. And um, yeah, we, as, as Nicholas says, the, there, there is a lot to be done uh, further on when it comes to helping those most vulnerable uh, that are struck by this pandemic. And so from Pentecostals and Charismatic for Peace and Justice, we really want to highlight and encourage all kinds of initiatives in order to help people. So thank you for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye, everybody. <laughs>